So we're going to be in Exodus chapter 14, um, and we're going to, before we get into the passage, I'm going to do a quick recap of what's happened in Exodus until we get, or before we get to uh, chapter 14, okay? So let's pray, and then we'll start with a recap. Lord, thank you for this day. Lord, thank you for, uh, Lord, again, another opportunity to be in your house. I pray you'd be with, uh, Lord, me as I preach uh, this evening, Lord. We've already had distractions tonight. I pray, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, help me to focus on your word, what you've laid on my heart to preach, Lord. I pray you would use it, uh, Lord, this evening. And uh, Lord, I pray you would help us, Lord, uh, to not just hear, but Lord, to take your word, to apply it to our lives. And uh, Lord, I pray it'll be a challenge and an encouragement and blessing, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, back in chapter one of Exodus. Well, first of all, what is Exodus about? I'll ask questions. It's a Wednesday. It's about the Exodus. What is the Exodus? <laughs> the Exodus is not the correct answer to what is the Exodus. <laughs> Pastor Josh. Exodus Egypt. Okay, all right. We'll get a little bit here. <laughs> Out of jail for free, yeah. Okay, so in chapter 1, Joseph dies, all right? So they had gone into Egypt. Joseph was there. They went into Egypt. Joseph was uh, high up, right? So Joseph dies, and the Israelites just continue to multiply and grow in number. Then there arises a Pharaoh, the Bible tells us, who didn't know Joseph. So I'm always curious about that. How long was it if you didn't know Joseph who had been so high up in their, in their, in their uh, government, in their uh, country? But he didn't know Joseph, and he saw the strength of the Israelites and basically decided this is in the best interest of my people to enslave these other people who are here. Okay? And he gives the command to kill all of the newborn male children in the hopes of really weakening the people. Okay, that's your army. Those are the people who are going to rise up and fight. So let's kill all of them before they can become men and fight against us. So in chapter 2, Moses is born. He's put in the bulrushes. And then he's brought into the palace of Pharaoh. And he grows to be a man there in Pharaoh's palace. As we continue through Exodus, we see Moses. He goes out. He sees an Egyptian hitting an Israelite, right? He's beating the Israelite. And so he ends up, really, he ends up killing the Egyptian. And then one of his brethren, Israelites, points out, Hey, you killed an Egyptian, which caused him to flee to the desert. So chapter 3, Moses is, is married now. He's keeping the sheep of his father-in-law. And God comes to him in the burning bush and calls him to go back and be his messenger to the people of Israel and to Pharaoh. And then God says, you're going to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. So chapters 4 through 12, we get Moses' excuses. And then finally yielding to God's call on his life. And he returns to Egypt he teams up with his brother Aaron. He meets with the elders of Israel. And then we see the 10 plagues that come. Okay? Uh, at the end of chapter 12 is the last plague. Anybody know what that is? What's the last plague? College students. Bible college students. What is it? Okay, the death of the firstborn. All right, so that's the end of chapter 12. There's that last plague. And then what happens? Pharaoh says, go. Right? He says, get out. Okay? So chapter 13, God leads the Israelites out of Egypt with a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, and it brings us to where we're going to be in chapter 14. All right, verses 1 and 2 of chapter 14. It says, And the, Mo or the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel that they turn and encamp before, oh boy, Pihahirath. I looked it up today and I got it wrong, I think, again. Between Migdal and the sea, over against Baal-Zephon, before it shall be, in, or before it, before it shall ye encamp by the sea. So, beginning of chapter 14, God tells Moses to turn and to encamp between Migdal and the sea. So the word Migdal means tower or fortress. Let's see if I can get my slides to work here, okay? Something like this, okay? A tower or a fortress that was used. And from what we know about ancient Egypt, they had these throughout their land, okay? And really, God put the Israelites in a place that didn't make much sense, okay? Um, it says in verse 20 of chapter 13 that they had reached the edge of the wilderness, okay? It says they took their journey from Succoth and camped in Etham in the edge of the wilderness. They had reached the end of it. Now, there's a lot of debate, a lot of weird maps out there. <laughs> of what they think the Exodus looked like. I was trying to find one to show you guys, and there was like, they crossed this lake. I said, well, that doesn't make sense if you're looking at the biblical account. And some, you know, and then they crossed here, and they crossed here, all right? I found one that sort of makes sense to me, all right? There's a whole movie about it. I got to watch it. Have you ever heard of Patterns of Evidence before? Okay, they have one on when the Exodus happened, but he also has one on the crossing of the Red Sea. I own them all. I've only watched one, so I need to watch the other ones. Uh, but he's done a lot of... of 
investigative work to, to, to say, okay, this is what the Bible has to say and what lines up with the Bible. But anyways, that's a whole side thing, <laughs> okay? So from what we understand, though, they had reached the edge of this wilderness, and God had them turn back and go towards this place, Pihahirath, okay? And so from what we can understand, this turn sort of puts them in a place where they're surrounded with nowhere to go. Okay, they've got mountains around them. There's nowhere they can go. Uh, there was this Migdal or an Egyptian watchtower or fortress somewhere near them, and they had the sea behind them. And it really was something that made no sense strategically. Okay, there was nothing they could do. But as we continue reading in chapter 14, God gives us his plan. Okay, in verse 3, For Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land. The wilderness hath shut them in. They're surrounded. Okay, they're entangled. There's nowhere for them to go. And then God says, and I will harden Pharaoh's heart that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh and upon all his hosts that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord, and they did so. So they obeyed God. God said, this is what I'm going to do, though. Pharaoh's going to say, look at them. They're, they're trapped. I know the area. They're trapped there. I'm going to come after them. And God says, but I will be honored upon Pharaoh. So God's plan was that this turn made Pharaoh think, they're trapped here. I'm going to go after them. In verse 5, it says, and it was told the king of Egypt, that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and of his servants was turned against the people, and they said, why have we done this, that we have let Israel go from serving us? So the news reaches Pharaoh, most likely from Migdal, that the Israelites were trapped, right? They had nowhere else to go. They were stopped. They were camped. Something interesting I found was that ancient Egypt is believed to have been the first to domesticate pigeons. I think it's cool, okay? I, I like all those little things that sort of come to play, and how could this have worked out? Uh, they used pigeons to relay messages. So based on where they believe Israel was camped, it would have only taken about five hours for a pigeon to get back and say, hey, they're here and they can come, okay? It had to get to Pharaoh somehow, right? All right. I think it's cool. Nobody else thinks it's cool. That's okay, okay? It's cool because the Bible says this is what happened, and when you really look and put everything together, you can see how it happened. You just got to use your imagination a little bit, Okay? And so Pharaoh gets this news. His heart was turned against the people. He regretted the decision to let them go. And he says, you know what? I've got a chance here. They're stuck. They can't go anywhere. There's the sea on one end. They're entangled by the wilderness. I can get to them and I can bring them back. It was almost as if God was setting a trap for the Egyptians. Okay, we know that the plagues was God showing his power over the false gods of the Egyptians. But was this God's way maybe of showing his power over the might of the Egyptians as well? Again, there's cool things when you look at history and where you look at, uh, again, this movie I just mentioned, this Patterns of Evidence. A lot of people say Israel left at a certain period of time, which is far too late. <laughs> so he does all this research and brings it back to a certain point in time, and I can't remember the years off the top of my head. But basically he said that if, if we place it at that point, a few years later, Egypt is overrun. <laughs> and Egypt is taken over by roaming tribes and roving people that take over Egypt. He said, how could that have happened unless their army was first gone? Okay, so God here, he says, okay, I've, I've shown my power over the gods of the Egyptians, and now I'm going to show my power over the might of the Egyptians. Their army is going to come. So the Egyptians were coming. They were chasing after the Israelites, intending to bring them back into slavery, and to their eyes, the Israelites were trapped with nowhere to go. So God had freed the Israelites, right? He had saved them from slavery, and now the enemy was coming back. And really, there's a parallel here to our lives as Christians. As a side note, when God saves us, we can't expect the devil to be happy about it. Uh, we can expect him, though, to come after us to try to bring us back into sin and back into bondage to fear. The devil is never going to take away our salvation, but he can take away our effectiveness for God by letting, or getting us to live in the past or to live in fear or to live in uncertainty. Because the devil doesn't want us to live free, as I preached about a couple weeks ago. He wants us to live in bondage. And so the Israelites, they were free, and here comes Pharaoh saying, I'm going to bring you back. They knew that the Egyptian army was coming. They said, there's nowhere for us to go. We're stuck. And fear begins to set in in verse 10. So look at verse 10 of chapter 14 with me. And when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes. And behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid or extremely afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. They were fearful. They knew what was coming. And really, if we're going to apply this to us, as we look around the world and look around us, there's fear all about us. We've got people who are still fearful about COVID. We've got uh, fearful about finances and job security and recession and the price of gas, which is a lot better right now than it was a month ago. 
or I fear about the safety of their families. And I don't know what you may be fearful about at this time, but a lot of what is going on around us, it doesn't make sense to us. A lot of times what happens in our lives doesn't make sense to us. We don't understand what God is doing, and if we aren't careful, fear will consume us. So as we continue through chapter 14, we're going to see what, that Moses stands up and speaks to the nation of Israel and encourages them. And so we're going to look at what God and Moses had to say to the Israelites during this time of uncertainty and fear in their lives. And my challenge tonight to you is that as Christians, we need to take what God and Moses told them and now put it into practice into our lives. When fear and uncertainty and anxiety and worry and all these things come into our lives, we can look to God and we can look to his word to help us through it. So my title was Stand Still. So I think you can guess what verse we're going to be looking at, all right? But the first thing that Moses tells the people in verse 13 is to fear not. Okay, and Moses said unto the people, fear ye not. So as we lead into this verse 13, all right, the fear had overtaken them. They knew that Pharaoh was near. They knew that he was coming. They had started to worry, to complain, to look backwards at Pharaoh coming towards them. All right, they had also looked backward and said, man, all the things that we had in Egypt, that would have been better than where we're at right now. And Moses, really, he starts off responding to them with this simple phrase, fear ye not. In essence, Moses was telling them to trust in God. Okay, fear is a lack of faith in what God has promised to do. Okay, so God had said, I'm going to bring you out of Egypt. You're going to be free. You're going to go into the promised land, all these things. And they looked back and had fear and said, it'd be better back there. Okay, they had, lack, uh, they had a lack of faith in what God had promised to do. Now, when the plagues were coming and then they were told to go, their faith was high. And then fear set in, and they said, okay, God, can God really do this? God had showed his power over any other god through the plagues. He had brought them out of the land of Egypt. And yet when they couldn't see a way past something, fear set in. And Moses says, fear not. Remember all that God has done for you and trust in him. And oftentimes in our lives, we allow fear to overtake us when we're faced with something we don't understand or with something that we don't see a way past. And we allow fear to take over instead of trusting in God. But when fear takes over, it really becomes fear that dictates our decisions. It di dictates our actions instead of our faith in God. I don't know. I've been there before. Maybe you guys have just been, everything is great. But when you get to a point of being fearful, that fear makes the decision for you instead of the faith in God. And it's a real struggle to back off and say, okay, I'm going to act in faith instead of in fear. Okay, my wife will, she's usually the counterbalance, all right? I'm fearful she has faith or she's fearful and I have faith. And we help offset each other a little bit because we say, we got to do this. We say, let's step back and walk in faith. And fear takes over our world all the time. We see it. During the peak of COVID-19, I was thinking back, okay? Uh, there wasn't much known about it. People bought all the toilet paper and Lysol wipes they could get their hands on, Remember? Remember the story about the lady who had the Lysol wipes and was in, like, the Costco parking lot making a killing because she had bought all of them from Costco and then was, like, tripling the price? Okay? It's crazy, right? But fear makes people do some crazy things. All right? During this year of 2022, there has been uh, market fears and stock markets and crypto and even stable investments that people say have held these for years are going crazy because people are fearful. Okay? The Israelites in verse 12, when we think about what they were really saying, okay, they said, is this not the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. Okay, they're basically saying it's better to stay a slave than to be free. That should blow your mind a little bit, okay? Better to stay a slave than it is to have been free. And so fear was dictating what they thought was best instead of their faith in God and in his working pastor preached on this last Wednesday in 2 Timothy where it says that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So don't let fear dictate your actions. Let faith guide them instead. So Moses said, fear not. Let's get rid of the fear because now you're saying crazy things like let's go back and be slaves again. Okay? He says, don't let fear dictate your actions. Let faith guide them instead. And so Moses says, fear not, but then he tells them to stand still in verse 13. So Moses said unto the people, fear ye not, Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show to you this day. For the Egyptians whom ye have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. So this phrase, stand still, really carries the sense of standing firm. So God is saying, you know what? Through Moses, God is telling Israel to take your stand. Stand firm, stand still, trust in me. 
Okay, I know in my life when I'm faced with something that is fearful, I try to do more and more instead of looking to God for answers. Okay, Moses tells the people of Israel to stop trying to figure it out. Stop being like, well, if we, you know, if we surrender, they'll take us back. We'll be able to be slaves again. Stop trying to do and instead start trusting. But he follows this statement. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The promise of God to the people of Israel was that if they would trust him, if they would stand still and wait for him to work, then he would save them from the Egyptians. Okay, this salvation would be to the extent that the Egyptians that they saw that day, they wouldn't see again. Cool, okay? They see them coming and God says, stand still, see the salvation of the Lord, and those guys you're seeing now, you'll never see them again. Okay, they'll be gone. The Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. God says, I'm going to take care of it. And that's an awesome promise from God to say, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. So when we face fear and uncertainty and worry in our lives and anxiety and all these different things that come, we can stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. We can stand still and trust in God. Now, I often tell people when we, when we talk about personalities and stuff that I'm a fixer, okay? And this, this is just basically when I hear a problem, I want to fix it, <laughs> okay? So if you come to me with a problem, I'm going to my mind starts working right away to try to figure out how to fix it. Sometimes it doesn't work great with my wife because she just says, I just want you to listen. I'm like, but I want to fix it, okay? And that's how we go. And so when I find myself anxious or worried or stressed or fearful, my instinct is to try to fix it. What can I do to fix this? What can I do that will change all of this? But Moses gives us the opposite. He says, don't try to fix it. He says, stand still. Stop trying to fix it. Instead, trust God. So he basically says, stop doing and start trusting in God. Because when we do, we're really relying on ourselves rather than on God. Right? When I say I can fix the problem or I can fix the fear or the worry or the anxiety or what's going on in my life right now, I'm saying it's all on me. It's about myself rather than, you know what? I'm going to stand still. I'm going to trust God with this. So Moses continues to give instruction. All right? So he says, fear not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. And then he tells them to be quiet. Okay, verse 14. The Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. I was going to say hold your peace, but be quiet sounds fun. More fun, all right? He says, God will fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. So why did he say this? All right, verses 10 to 12, if we go back and see what was going on in the camp. All right, Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid, and the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not, the word, or is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness." They were worried, they were complaining, they were looking back to Egypt, wishing they had never left. They would have rather stayed slaves than to be in the position that they were in. And Moses says, the Lord shall fight for you and ye shall hold your peace. Be quiet (laughs) and watch God fight. Watch God work. Sometimes, though, I find in our lives as Christians, we look at our lives and say, man, it's hard following God. Sometimes we might even say, you know what, it would be easier if I wasn't following God. Really? You would rather be living in bondage to sin, to fear, to your flesh, to the devil, instead of living a life of freedom in Christ and a life of hope and joy, knowing that you have forgiveness of your sin, knowing that you have a home in heaven? Living for Christ, yes, it's not going to always be easy. Okay, but living for Christ is always going to be best. Okay, God doesn't promise us just ease every time we get saved, or when we get saved, every time we get saved. That's bad, okay? <laughs> okay, God doesn't say when you get saved, your life is just going to be easy the rest of, the rest of the time, okay? That's not what God tells us. He doesn't say it's always going to be easy, but it will always be the best way. So we need to learn in times of uncertainty, in times of fear, that complaining and worrying and speculating and trying to solve all the problems around us in our lives, it won't help. It won't help. We need to be quiet. Hold our peace and watch God work. Give it to God. Stand still. Fear not and let God do the work. Trust in the promises of God. The promise that he will fight for us. It's not going to be anything that we have done or said. Okay? Our salvation is from the Lord, not from ourselves. 
And we need to learn to be quiet and to hold our peace and to let God work. In the next chapter of Exodus, so chapter 15, Moses and the children of Israel sing a song unto the Lord. So look at verse 2 of Exodus 15 with me. See, one of the first things they say in the song is, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him in habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. So God said, you know what? Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. In, verse, in chapter 15, they said, the Lord's now our salvation. They had seen him work. They had seen him do what he had said he would do. And this theme is really seen throughout the Old Testament. Isaiah 12, 2 says, behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. The Psalms are full of language like this. The Lord is my light in Psalm 27 and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Psalm 18 and verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength in whom I will trust, my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Psalm 62, verse 6, he only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. I could continue with verse after verse that point to God being our rock and our shield and our salvation and our tower and our fortress and our defense and more and more descriptions of what God is to us. We often get caught up in the complaining and the worrying instead of trusting in the promises of God. Okay, I've been there, whether it's fear over finances or over the state of our world or a personal situation going on in your life. We can't let fear reign in our life. We need to instead turn to the God of our salvation. So there's fear that binds us up, or we can turn to the God of our salvation. So God uh, is saying, fear not, trust in God. It's easy to get caught up in the speculating and the complaining and the worrying instead of holding our peace and looking to God for the answers. So tonight, maybe you need to turn your eyes towards Jesus and trust him through whatever fear you're facing. Maybe you need to take time with God tonight and say, okay, I'm going to give you my fear, God. I'm going to turn it over to you. I'm going to lay it down before you and trust you to take care of it. Trust him to bring guidance and direction. Trust him to provide. Trust him to protect and defend you or to work in a, a person's life or to heal or to bring comfort and peace. Whatever it is tonight, give it to God. Say, God, I'm laying it down. I'm going to hold my peace. I'm going to stop trying to figure it all out. I'm going to fear not, and I'm going to stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. The last thing, though, that Moses is going to tell the people of Israel, something that comes directly from God, and he tells them to go forward in verse 15 of chapter 14. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. So this was our church's theme verse in 2019. Our theme was forward. Pastor preached uh, through many different aspects of how we can go forward in our lives and in our church. But as we apply it to what we see the Israelites doing here and what's going on with them, God is telling them, stop worrying, stop complaining. He says, why do you cry unto me? Wherefore criest thou unto me? Stop looking back and instead trust me and go forward. Now, we think of what was ahead of them, all right? There was mountains surrounding them they couldn't get through. There was Pharaoh coming the one way, and there was the sea going the other way. None of those seemed like a good choice, and yet God said, go forward. Now, it's interesting. God tells them to go forward, and then he tells them what his plan is. Okay, oftentimes in life, God might instruct us to move forward, but then not really give us the full plan of what he's got ahead. He says, okay, stop crying unto me. And go forward, and then he says, okay, now this is what you're going to do. You're going to lift up your rod. I'm going to divide the sea. You're going to go through the sea. So as individuals, when we look at our lives, sometimes we say, okay, I think God is leading me in this way, and we don't see what's past that. Go forward. We need to stop looking behind, stop looking around, and instead keep our eyes on God and go forward. If the future is uncertain, go forward and trust God. It's so easy to get distracted, to take our eyes off of Jesus off of his promises to us, and instead to begin looking at everything around us. Now, it reminds me a little bit of Peter, and I love the story of Peter and when Jesus calls him to walk on the water, okay? Jesus is the first and only man outside of Jesus, all right, to ever walk on water, and he started off great in Matthew 14. It gives us the rest of the account. It tells us that he said, come, so Jesus said, come, and when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately, 
Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him and said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, and when he did so, he started to sink. Okay, the news will always be there, and the news will always be bad. Okay, it's, it always seems to be bad. From, again, recession warnings to COVID, fear is everywhere. You see it when you go to the store in other people's eyes, and you might see it in the mirror in your eyes sometimes. And it's easy to take our eyes off of Jesus and to place it on everything going on around us or the circumstances in our life. But when we take our eyes off of Jesus, you will sink. You will get overwhelmed by it all. You will uh, sink into whatever is going on. But what's awesome about the account of Peter walking on the water to Jesus is that when he started to sink, he cried out to Jesus. And it says, immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and caught him. If you've trusted in Jesus as your Savior, he's already rescued you rescued you out of bondage, like he rescued the Israelites out of Egypt. If you haven't trusted in Jesus, really, you can come tonight, and you can find forgiveness for your sin. But if you have trusted in Christ, the devil's not going to leave you alone. He's not going to say, well, okay, I'm done now, okay? Like Pharaoh chasing after the Israelites, the devil wants to bring you back into sin. He wants to bring you back into fear. He wants to bring you back to a place that you feel you can't get past or can't get through, And I don't know what the fear is that you might be facing in your life, but as God, or just as God did for Israel, and just as Jesus did for Peter, when you cry out to God, he will reach out and catch you. Don't let the storms around you to take your eyes off of Jesus. And trust the waves, the wind, the sea, the uncertainty, the fear, the anxiousness to him, and trust him to fight for you because he will. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. As we finish tonight, we're going to look at a chunk of verses at the very end of chapter 14. So turn to verse 24. And we're going to read from verse 24 to the end of the chapter. And it came to pass that in the morning watch the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels that they drave them heavily, so that the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the face of Israel, for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea, that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it, and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea." And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the hosts of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. There remained not so much as one of them. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the seashore. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians." And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. Notice verse 25. The Egyptians said this. Let's flee, let us flee from the face of Israel for the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. How awesome is that? God promised back in verse 14. Stand still. See the salvation of the Lord. Verse 14. Uh, it says the Lord shall fight for you. And God fulfilled that promise. Okay, God has promised us as Christians to never leave us and to forsake us, or to forsake us. God has promised to give, us, or give strength to the weary, to strengthen and to uphold us, to help us, to walk with us through the fire and the flood. He has promised that nothing can separate us from his love and that nothing can take us out of his hand. And just as God fulfilled his promise to the Israelites, he'll fulfill his promises to us. He hasn't changed, Okay. He is still the same God that said, hey, I will fight for you here. He'll fight for us now. And the Israelites went forward and they saw God do great things. So whatever is causing fear in your life right now, I don't care what it is, all right? Job security, finances, again, prices of gas and food and all the things that are changing in our world. Maybe it's a personal thing going on. Whatever it is, fear not. Stand still. Be quiet. Hold your peace and let God work. And then go forward. When we go forward and we follow God, we will see God do great things. So trusting in God is really the safest place that you can be, okay? The safest place you can be in life is in a place where you're saying, you know what? I don't know what's going on. I don't understand what's going on, but I'm trusting God. And don't ever let fear get you out of that spot because it it will do its best. (laughs) 
Okay, fear will come in, and you're going to say, man, I got to do this, 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 and you move out of trusting in God to trusting in yourself. But the safest place you're going to be is when you are trusting in God. And I'm not saying, I've said this many times, I'm not saying you don't look for a job if you need a job, okay? Okay. I'm not saying that you don't do a budget and say, man, I'm just going to just rack up my credit card bill. I don't say you don't take precautions with whatever's going on in life, okay? That's not what God says, okay? God's given us brains so we can use them, okay? That's what I... It's a good thing, okay? God's given you a brain. Learn how to use it, all right? God does say we need to be wise, but we don't need to let our wisdom take precedence over trusting in God because our wisdom does not match God's wisdom ever, Okay, so God says, do what you can, but trust God to do the rest. And when you're overwhelmed by fear and you're overwhelmed by what's coming at you, maybe you need to stop doing and say, God, I'm handing it over to you, and I'm going to trust in you, and let him comfort and bring peace to your life, and then move on and keep going and move forward. Nothing that is going on in our world today has surprised God, and nothing that is going on in your life personally has surprised God. So trust in him. Worrying about whatever it might be, it won't change anything. Focus on God and focus on what God would have you to do and then do it and to move forward. I mean, if you really think about it, we have trusted God with our eternity, our salvation, and yet we often fail to trust him with providing. You see how silly that looks? Eternity, the biggest thing we can give to God and a job. And we're like, man, I can't trust God with that. You can So if you get nothing else tonight, get this, you can trust God. Let's look at verse 13 one more time. Exodus 14. I just closed my Bible. (laughs) 14 and verse 13. But this time, Moses here is speaking to the Israelites. Look at it as if Moses is speaking to you. God is speaking to you. It says, fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord. You can trust him. You don't need to fear. You can stand still and see God work. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you again for your word.